Now, uh, the second session of uh, the 2021 IIPCC will begin. Uh, this session will look at recent trends in granting compulsory licenses, and it will be moderated by Sumin Kwan, the High Court Judge uh, at Patent Court of uh, Korea. And let's invite him and also the panelist, Judge Ku Sung Jin, to the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am uh, Sun Ming Kwan, uh, Judge Hun Min Kwan, uh, currently serving at the Patent Court of Korea. Uh, I'm going to be moderating the session on the recent trends in granting compulsory licenses. I will be asking our panelists uh, about their valuable insights into this topic. So I hope those of you are taking part on site or via online um, to be able to gain very beneficial information and new insights into this topic. And uh, let me introduce the panels. First, uh, for detailed bios, uh, please refer to the reference book. First, uh, from the United States, we have with us uh, uh, Sabina Kumar, professor at uh, University of Houston Law Center. Uh, despite it being uh, very late in the um, evening, um, professor is taking part in today's event. And uh, next is Pratiba Singh, presiding judge of Delhi High Court. Next is uh, from the Munhen University, uh, Professor Dr. Jochera, private law, intellectual property, and unfair competition at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich. Uh, despite this being very early in the morning, um, uh, Professor uh, Asghar Oli is with us. Uh, and finally, we have with us uh, Song Jin Koo, judge at the Patent Court of uh, Korea. Recently, due to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, centering around the developing countries, uh, there are uh, increasing voices calling for the compulsory licensing under uh, the waiver from uh, provisions of the uh, TRIPS agreement uh, for the vaccine treatment. And uh, the developed uh, countries uh, are resisting this movement uh, with concerns that this might undermine the very purpose of the patent system. And so in this situation, uh, I think this will be a very meaningful session in order to find a harmonious solution uh, to this uh, conundrum. In session two, we will be looking at uh, four topics. First is uh, on uh, the type and the requirements for compulsory licensing, and second is for the calculation of consideration for compulsory licensing. Third is the procedures related to compulsory license, and the fourth topic will be about how such issues are playing out in different countries. And so with regards to the pharmaceutical compulsory licensing, which is gathering a lot of attention, we will be discussing this topic. What we would like to at this point is that uh, already the panelist has submitted very detailed answers for all of the questions. So in the reference book that you have received, these written answers are all included. And so because we only have one hour allotted to us, uh, uh, at this session, we will uh, have to ask you to uh, answer uh, in a way that is concise and deals with the key points in your answers. Uh, so when you uh, speak, uh, please uh, keep in mind the time uh, that is indicated in the screen. So I ask for this understanding from the panelists. And now we will uh, discuss this uh, topic in session two about the type and requirements of compulsory licensing. So let me ask two questions uh, altogether. So the type and requirements of compulsory licensing uh, related to patent rights in your country, especially whether there's a requirement of public interest, and secondly, whether pharmaceutical patents have any uh, differentiated requirement compared to other uh, patents. First, we would like to invite uh, Professor Kumar about what's the case in the United States. Thank you. In the United States, there are two applicable provisions relating to compulsory licensing, 28 U.S.C. Section 1498 and the Bayh-Dole Act. 
Under 28 U.S.C. Section 19, uh, 1498, this addresses the situation in which the government or a government contractor uses a patent without permission. Generally speaking, the government has very broad powers to use patents. There are no formal requirements that the government needs to meet before it uses a patent, whether pharmaceutical related or not. Um, and generally, the government cannot be sued without its express consent. What Section 1498 does is the government provides limited consent to be sued for patent infringement, allowing the patent holder to obtain damages, though injunctive relief is not available to the patent holder. And it's worth noting that the government need not inform the patent holder that it is using its patent without permission. Under the Bayh-Dole Act, that covers inventions that arise from government-funded research. A federal government agency that funds research retains a royalty-free license to practice the patent. And also, a third party can petition for a compulsory license under the Bayh-Dole Act from the federal government uh, by filing a request with the government agency that funded the original research. For these margin rights under the Bayh-Dole Act, they're supposed to be used to alleviate health or safety needs which are not being reasonably met by the patent holder. However, it's important to note that no agency has ever utilized these margin rights making it unclear in the United States exactly how useful they are, nor has any third party petition for March and Rights ever been approved. Thank you. Thank you. So there is no general provision uh, on the compulsory licensing in the U.S., but uh, they have the Article uh, 1498 under the U.S.C., as mentioned, and there is the Beidol Act. Uh, from the Patent Act Articles uh, 200 to uh, 2012, uh, that is where you can find the Beidol Act. Now we will uh, listen from uh, Judge Singh from India. Uh, she sent a very detailed response in the IP uh, law field, even besides patent, but today, please, uh, given the limited time, focus on patent, please. Thanks. Very good morning to all of you in Seoul. Uh, good evening to the other participants from the U.S. and in Munich. Thank you for having me. Uh, on compulsory licensing, as the uh, moderator and the introductory three speakers have said, I will focus on patents because we do have compulsory licensing in copyrights as also in the field of telecommunications. If you're interested in those, you can look at page 64 and 65 of the reference book. But coming to patents themselves, I think there are uh, two relevant provisions. The first relevant provision is section 84 under the Patent Act by which, in which the controller can either sue a motto or on an application by any person interested, grant a compulsory license. There are broadly three tests that are uh, required to be satisfied. Firstly, if the patentee is not satisfying the reasonable requirements of the public in India. Number two, if the patented product or commodity is not available at a reasonably affordable price, and three, if the invention is not being worked in India. On all these three grounds, the party can approach the controller for a compulsory license. Secondly, in public interest under section 92, the central government also has the power to issue a notification that the patent would not be enforced by, uh, by the patentee. So the three conditions which would be normally considered by the central government would be if there is a case of a national emergency or if there is a case of extreme urgency or in the case of a public, in the case uh, the patented invention is required for public non-commercial use. So on all these three grounds under section 92, the central government can also issue a license 
though the license can be issued without hearing the patentee however the terms and conditions would have to be fixed thereafter and the intention would always be to ensure that the patented product is available at the lowest price to the public and the controller and the central government normally would uh, apply the test of public interest while granting a compulsory uh, license and you can see the definition of public interest in the buyer judgment which is at page 65 of the reference book thank you 예 감사합니다 다음은 독일의 올리 교수님의 답변을 Thank you now we will listen from professor Oli uh, from Germany Thank you very much uh, and good morning from Munich. Uh, compulsory, the law of compulsory licensing in Germany can be compared to Sleeping Beauty and the Sword of Damocles. Sleeping Beauty, it was sleeping for a very, very long time. Um, there were no cases of compulsory licenses until 2017, when arguably the Sleeping Beauty was kissed awake by the Supreme Court. The Sword of Damocles, it's pending over the patent owner. Um, it doesn't fall down, but the patent owner needs to be aware that it can always fall down. Next slide, please. Um, in Europe, there is no provision for uh, compulsory licenses in general, even not under the unified patent court agreement, which might enter into uh, force soon. So the provisions that exist um, are German law provisions, namely the provision for compulsory licenses in uh, section 24 of the German Patents Act. There is also a provision on state use um, and I should also mention that remedies against the misuse of a dominant position in friend cases can have a similar effect. And finally, I should point out that there is a new disproportionality defense, slightly reminiscent of the eBay and Merck exchange case in the United States, but not as far reaching in German law. Now, the requirements under section 24, which are on the next slide, is that the license seeker must unsuccessfully attempt to obtain permission, and there must be a public interest which requires the compulsory license. As for the public interest, next slide, please. The onus of proof is on the uh, applicant. Um, and all cases that we have had on public interest really concern medicinal products. We don't have any cases from other areas of technology. Um, one criterion, if the applicant's product possesses properties which other products on the market do not have, or if the product has less side effects, then this might be a reason for finding the public interest. This was found in one case about which I will talk uh, a little bit later, the Ralte Gravier case, which was the one case where a compulsory license was upheld by the Supreme Court. However, if the public interest can be satisfied by other um, basically equivalent products, that militates against finding a public interest. The attempt to obtain permission within reasonable time must be determined on a case-by-case -case, um, basis, but it can be started after the application has been made, but it must be made within a reasonable time. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. So India and uh, Germany has two types of compulsory licensing, uh, one uh, by the government. And also the cases are looked at to determine the scope. But there is no uh, EU uh, level uh, provision, and that was very interesting. And also the Sleeping Beauty analogy, I guess, uh, still works here. I guess she is still waiting for the case. Uh, please uh, compare uh, what you have uh, with our system in Korea. Now we will hear from Judge Ku. Hello, I am Judge Ku. So about compulsory licensing, I am very uh, appreciating this time to talk with the panels of other countries. Well, when it comes to the Korean Patent Act, there are two types of compulsory licensing. First is when there is a national or dire emergency or when there is a need for public interests, the government deems it necessary to, for uh, granting compulsory licensing. And type two is when a party with intent to practice the patent invention files a petition for at 
adjudication and uh, without any justifiable causes in natural disaster or force majeure event if the patent has not been practiced in Korea for at least three consecutive years except it, uh, and if it four years have passed since the filing date of the patent application and second if it's necessary to practice for public interest and third if it is necessary to practice the invention to export medicines to country that intends to import them then this compulsory licenses is granted and for reasons that are directly tied to lives of nationals uh, such as preservation of life health and property this would be deemed as public interests and for uh, the pharmaceuticals the following are the grounds for petitions to import medicines it must be for diseases that threaten the public health and uh, there should be no sufficient manufacturing facilities in Korea for that particular medicine and it must be a time uh, when the Minister of the Interior and Safety declares as a state of disaster to mitigate the grave effect and damage. And also, second is a case where uh, we need to export to a country that intends to import. Thank you. Uh, so next, going on to the second topic, uh, that is the criteria for estimating uh, the remuneration or compensation for compulsory licensing. What are the biggest reasons, uh, traditional reasons for granting, uh, for uh, being reluctant to grant compulsory licensing is the issue of compensation. And uh, this shows how sensitive uh, an issue it is to estimate the compensation for compulsory compulsory licensing. So I'm going to ask two questions here. So the first question would be, so what are the estimation criteria and what uh, factors are considered in determining the payment for compulsory licensing? And secondly, how is uh, the uh, payment uh, estimation for compulsory licensing different from the reasonable loyalty that is recognized as damages in an infringement case? So we'll hear first uh, from Judge Singh to hear about the Indian case. The, broadly, the four factors that are considered in a compulsory license application would be, firstly, the investment made by the patentee if they prove it on record. Secondly, what is the extent of working they are themselves doing and what are the margins, etc., that they are uh, generally using for sale of the product? Thirdly, what does the controller think is the reasonable price that the consumer can pay, keeping the first and the second factor in mind? And fourthly, the duration of the license. So if it's a longer license period, then the royalty can be uh, you know, distributed over a longer period, and therefore it could be a smaller royalty rate. But if it's for a shorter license period, then the royalty rate would be is likely to be higher. But insofar as contrasting this with damages and infringement is concerned, in infringement cases, there are three types of damages that can be granted direct damages, indirect damages, and punitive or exemplary damages. But insofar in direct and indirect damages, this we follow the normal principles of common law while we calculate uh, how to grant damages. And sometimes there are other accentuating factors which may lead to higher damages. But in the case of intellectual property, usually punitive damages are not granted by Indian courts. And uh, in order to tell you as to um, uh, you know, what is the way in which royalty is calculated, I would like to take the case of one of the uh, compulsory licensing cases of buyer which was granted in India. And this was the Nexavar drug. There, the royalty which was granted was uh, based on the UNDP uh, recommended royalty rate, which was 4%. That's what the controller gave. But then the IPAB increased it to 6 to 7% after considering the fact that the applicant for the compulsory license, i.e. the generic company which was making it, was having a large amount of margins to its distributors and retailers. So it was increased from 4 to 6 to 7 percent. But the most important feature of that case was that the patentee did not give any evidence to show what was their investment in the drug research. So that led to this kind of a royalty rate, which was 4 percent initially, and 6 to 7 percent of the net selling price. So I would like to stop here. We can expand it in the next question. Yeah, 
So thank you very much. Uh, by law, uh, India has uh, very detailed regulations for estimating the compensation. And the next of our case, I think, will be introduced in more detail in the fourth question. So next, uh, we'll hear from Professor Ol uh, Lee from uh, Germany. Yes, thank you. As I mentioned before, there is only one case in which a compulsory license was upheld, so we do not have much experience in Germany with the calculation of royalties. German courts basically use the same method for calculating adequate remuneration uh, for compulsory licenses as for reasonable royalties when assessing damages. There are three possibilities how you can assess damages in German law. The reasonable royalties approach is one of them, and basically the same principles apply to the calculation of um, the uh, remuneration in the case of a compulsory license. So the starting point, the reference value, would be the net turnover from the sale of the applicant's product. But if only one component of the product falls within the scope of the patent, this can be reduced. Um, there are several factors that courts take into account when determining the percentage. The range of the percentage seems to be between 2 and 10%. Sometimes it's mentioned that the percentage can be as high as 15%, but uh, there are no, as I said, there is no practical experience with that. Factors are the scope of the compulsory license, the broader the scope, the higher the compensation. Significance and value of the patent, the higher the inventive step, the higher the significance for technological pro progress, the higher the compensation, the threat potential of the, uh, the threat of a potential injunction, whether the invention is already ready or whether the applicant still has to invest own efforts, and whether the license is granted to a direct competitor or whether it's not. In the Ralti Gravier case, the only case which we have, uh, the court considered the threat potential to be rather high as the applicant made significant progress by selling this particular drug and would have been compelled to take the drug from the market uh, had there been no compulsory license. Also, the parties were direct competitors. On the other hand, the patent did not disclose the drug uh, as such, but it gave rather basic information. Indeed, the patent was revoked at a later stage. So it was a rather weak patent, and it still required quite a bit of de development on behalf of the applicant. Also, the compulsory license did not cover the full scope of the patent, but only a smaller section. Based on these factors, the Federal Patent Court held that a license fee of 4% of the applicant's net turnover was appropriate. Thank you. So thank you very much uh, uh, to your court presidents. Uh, uh, the compensation for compulsory licensing uh, is uh, determined. So the Rotterdam case is very important. So in the fourth question, I think we will go back to this case again. Next, uh, uh, Professor Kumar from United States will answer the question. For compensation cases under 28 U.S.C. Section 1498, the statute itself provides little guidance. So courts look to the Patent Act um, for guidance in terms of how to compensate the patent holder. And what they generally do is they award a reasonable royalty based on a complicated 15-factor test um, known as the Georgia Pacific Factors. In the interest of time, I will not go into all 15 of the Georgia Pacific factors, but just realize that it's many, many steps, uh, many different factors that get balanced uh, to determine if a reasonable royalty is appropriate and what level that reasonable royalty shall be. Theoretically, lost profits can also be recovered, at least in some infringement actions against the government. However, such damages seem to be very uncommon. Now, under the Bayh-Dole Act, it depends on whether you are talking about the federal government or a third party. Um, a federal government that funds research resulting in a patent retains a paid up license. So theoretically, they could exercise their margin rights and not have to pay any royalties at all to the patent holder. A third party utilizing margin rights under Bayh-Dole would be obligated to pay compensation upon terms that are reasonable under the circumstances. 
However, we have a sleeping beauty problem of our own in the United States where sleeping beauty is still waiting for a kiss. That is to say, we don't have a single case where an agency has used March and rights or where a third party has successfully um, obtained March and rights and petitioned for compulsory licensing. So in the United States, we don't know either exactly how that would be calculated, what would be considered to be a reasonable compensation because we have no case law. 예, 감사합니다. Thank you very much. Uh, so the sleeping beauty analogy is used extensively today. Uh, so the case of uh, Beidou Act, only in limited cases, uh, uh, payment should be paid out. However, uh, not a lot of court precedent exists. Uh, so let us compare with the Korean case. Uh, so I think the situation in Korea is similar. In the case of uh, Korea, with regard to this uh, issue, uh, the Patent Act of Korea stipulates that when adjudicating grants of a non-exclusive license, the remuneration shall, in principle, be based on the total amount of estimated royalty for the patent term and shall be calculated by multiplying the following, the total estimated sales quantity, sum of estimated sales quantity by year during the practice term, the unit price of sales and average of factory price by year during the practice term, and share a ratio derived from how much the patent contributed in producing the unit product, and the reference ratio of 3%. However, this is subject to change in 2 to 4% in light of practical value, industry applicability, etc. of the patent. Uh, in cases where the total sales quantities are hard uh, to estimate, an amount of compensation or remuneration per product unit uh, may be calculated as follows. The unit price of the product times share times the reference uh, ratio. Uh, actually, um, in addition, the cases where an amount of compensation or remuneration is not determinable as stated above, the amount may be determined pursuant to the criteria announced by the Commissioner of Kipo. According to the announcement aforementioned, the amount shall be based on the arithmetic means of the invention values evaluated by the three evaluation institutes. Uh, the, so um, it is true that the formula used to calculate the amount of compensation for a compulsory license, which is the total estimated sales quantity times unit price uh, and share, times share, times reference, is structurally similar to the reasonable royalty recognized as damages and patent infringement lawsuits. This is because if a compulsory license is granted, it shall be deemed that an agreement is made between the parties as stipulated in the written adjudication. However, the two are distinguishable in that a reference rate used for the calculation compensation is set to 3% and could be adjusted in a range of 2 to 4% in light of industry applicability, while the reasonable royalty should be determined in an objective and reasonable manner. Thank you very much. Now let's move on to the third uh, question uh, on the procedures for compulsory licensing. I will ask four sub-questions together. So first, how does your country stipulate the applicant and respondent for compulsory licensing and who adjudicates on a petition, and uh, second, uh, is a non-exclusive licensee eligible for compensation, and third, which process is used uh, between documentary examination and oral argument, and uh, fourth, how can parties appeal to the adjudication? First, let's hear from Professor Oli. Um, thank you. So the applicant under German law is the company which seeks the license and must be capable of working the invention, and the respondent is the patent owner. The exclusive licensee can join the proceedings if it wishes as an intervener under the general rules of German civil procedure law. The competent authority for granting compulsory licenses is the Federal Patent Court, das Bundespatentgericht, and the Federal Patent Court applies its general rules of procedure, so basically the same rules of procedure which also apply in revocation proceedings. I should also point out that um, compulsory licenses can be granted in interlocutory proceedings, and they have actually been granted in interlocutory proceedings. In particular, the Ralte Gravier case, which I will talk about in a minute, was a case of interlocutory proceedings. A non-exclusive licensee is not eligible for remuneration. Um, appeal against the decisions of the Federal Supreme Court can be made to the, uh, or um, appeal against uh, the decisions of the Federal Patents Court can be made to the Federal Supreme Court. This appeal is an appeal on both points of law and facts. Thank you. 
So the court, the patent court adjudicates on compulsory licensing. This is very interesting. And now let's hear from Professor Kumar uh, for the U.S. Under Section 1498, these cases are litigated in the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. Um, and they are a bench trial similar to any other federal court case, but no trial by jury is available. Either the patent holder or an exclusive licensee um, is the applicant. Like either of those parties may file a Section 1498 proceeding seeking damages against either the federal government or a federal government contractor that's using the patent without permission. In the event of an adverse decision, the uh, patent holder or exclusive licensee may appeal that decision to the US Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Non-exclusive licensees do not appear to have any rights under Section 1498. Under the Bayh-Dole Act, Marchand rights are subject to a very complex and cumbersome administrative process. So cumbersome that it's been subject of great criticism in terms of just how difficult it is to navigate. If the funding agency were to decide to issue a compulsory license under the Bayh-Dole Act, then the decision would not take effect until the inventor, assignee, or exclusive licensee had the opportunity to appeal the decision first. Um, again, non-exclusive licensees do not appear to have any rights um, under the Bayh-Dole Act. And again, I must mention, we don't have cases where um, a march in rights or compulsory license have been issued under the Bayh-Dole Act. So we can only speculate based off of what the statute tells us. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, you mentioned that maybe the extremely complex uh, procedures may be a reason why there are no cases uh, where compulsory licenses were granted under Beidol Act. Now let's hear from Professor uh, Judge Singh for India. Thank you. Um, in India, we are... Um, there are two procedures with which the compulsory licensing can be granted. And uh, any person who is interested could apply for a compulsory license to the controller. Uh, it can be opposed. The controller has to first take a prima facie view as to whether a case is made out to even start the proceeding. Once the controller thinks that there is some prima facie case made out, then the copy of the license petition is sent to the patentee it can even be opposed by any licensee whose name may be on the register or any other person interested. It says any person desiring to oppose the application or the patentee. So it can, I think by that uh, terminology, even a non-exclusive license can oppose the grant of a compulsory license. So after the um, application is filed, the usual pleadings are completed and a hearing has to be granted to the patentee or the opponent by the controller. Even in case of uh, where the central government has you know, issued a notification for grant of compulsory license without hearing the patentee, thereafter, all these procedures have to be followed and the proper terms and conditions would have to be set by the controller. So the in India, the compulsory license cannot be granted by a court of law. It can be granted only by the controller. And uh, the the, after the controller has taken a decision on this matter, usually the matter used to go in appeal to the IPAB, but now the IPAB has been abolished a few months ago, and therefore it would go to the high court concerned. Uh, the interesting uh, question, however, is uh, that in India, we've only had one major compulsory license which has been granted, and at least three or four of them which have been rejected. And I think in the next few questions, you would be highlighting that uh, those cases, and I'll be uh, discussing uh, about the same. And in so far as documentary and oral evidence is concerned, yes, initially there are oral uh, documentary pleadings and affidavits and evidence, but thereafter the oral hearing is also granted to the patentee and to the compulsory license uh, 
applicant. So those are my comments on this. Yeah, 감사합니다. Thank you. So the appeal is no longer going to be forwarded to IPAB, but the High Court instead. That was impressive. And lastly, we will hear from Judge Ku. So, as for Korea, the, in type 1 cases, applicant is the government, and in type 2, it is a person who intends to practice the patented invention. The respondent is the patent owner. And if exclusive license is in granted, then uh, whether exclusive licensee and the patent owner should be joint respondents or only the exclusive licensee should be is still debated. And Kipos commissioner is the adjudicator. For type 1, uh, non-exclusive licensees are eligible, but there is no clear provision uh, when it comes to type 2, so this could lead to some debate. According to the presidential decree, in Article 4, well, the petition for adjudication has to be delivered to the non-exclusive licensee also, and when determining the compensation, the non-exclusive licensee's opinion will be heard. Basically, the adjudication is made through documentary examination, and the commissioner may hear the opinions of the Industrial Property Dispute Mediation Committee and the heads of relevant authorities. Uh, but for type 2, it is not only for determining the compensation, but also to make the adjudication itself. So it has allows a wider, uh, broader room for uh, incoming opinions from diverse experts and relevant authorities. When it comes to appeal method for type 1, the general administrative opposition procedures is followed, while for type 2, administrative appeals or revocation actions can be filed against the adjudication. However, the compensation determined by the adjudication shall not be ground for appeal. This is to prevent the procedures from being delayed. In order to uh, appeal the remuneration, there should be a separate suit that should be filed. So uh, the non-exclusive uh, license holder can also receive compensation under the Korean law. I think that was a key characteristic of Korea. So we'll go on to the fourth and very last topic. In the case of the fourth uh, topic, uh, we'll look at the uh, major cases related to compulsory licensing in the pharmaceutical area. We'll divide this uh, topic into two categories. Uh, first, uh, whether there are any cases in which uh, pharmaceutical uh, compulsory licensing has been granted or uh, prices have been lowered because of this, uh, and also whether there are any cases in which the compulsory licensing on pharmaceutical products have been dismissed. dismissed. So we'll look at those cases where it was actually granted. Um, with regards to uh, Professor Kumar, uh, so after the 911 uh, attacks, uh, there was a case where the drug price has been lowered for the ciprofloxacin uh, antibody. So in the early 2000s, there was a bioterrorist attack in which anthrax got sent through the mail system and thousands of people got sick, primarily postal workers. And the main treatment for these anthrax attacks was ciprofloxacin, uh, which belonged to Bayer, was still under patent. So the US government sought to purchase large quantities of this antibiotic from Bayer, and Bayer was offering, a, offering the drug, but at a relatively high price, um, between $1.75 and $1.83 per tablet. The government thought that this price was too high and negotiations began. Now, during this time, Canada, um, was licensing a domestic or licensed the drug to a domestic pharmaceutical company to produce a generic version of uh, ciprofloxacin without Bayer's permission. And by when Canada did that, Bayer began negotiating with it and started offering better prices, um, finally uh, offering it for only a dollar thirty a tablet. So in light of the, the Canadian government's successful negotiation, the US threatened to produce its own generic version of the drug. And moreover, it threatened to go one step further. Um, it threatened to pass legislation to actually strip Bayer of any compensation. Normally under 1498, it would be t entitled to um, a reasonable royalty, and the government was threatening to take even that away from Bayer. So 
faced with these threats, Bayer agreed to sell ciprofloxacin for only 95 cents a tablet. So theoretically, the government did not formally exercise its compulsory licensing power, but it threatened uh, the Bayer Corporation, so it effectively was using that power. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So, uh, traditionally, the uh, United States has been uh, very passive in granting compulsory licensing. Uh, however, uh, in this uh, situation of anthrax attack for public interest, uh, the United States government showed its uh, willingness uh, to intervene if necessary. I think that was a very significant case. Next, the floor goes to Dr. Uh, Judge Xing uh, about the uh, Sora Penny case. Yes, thank you. Uh, this was the uh, serafinib tozylate case, uh, which was uh, used for treating uh, liver and kidney cancer. This was a drug which was uh, not a cure. I mean, I must not use the word cure. It was expected to, you know, increase the life expectancy of the pa patients who were suffering from cancer. And the drug itself was not being manufactured by Bayer in India. Uh, in 2008, there was hardly any imports. 2009, 10, there were very, very minimal imports, and there were a num large number of patients who required the drug. Uh, that's when the generic company called Natco applied for a compulsory license, and uh, the price at which they agreed to sell the product to the consumers was uh, 1 by 30th, I mean 30 times lower than buyer's uh, product. And uh, the product of buyer was available for 120 tablets, it was $284,000, uh, 284,000 rupees. And uh, what Natco wanted to sell it was at 8,800 rupees. So it was considerably lower. And uh, when they applied for the compulsory license, the controller uh, looked into the statistics and looked at all the working that was being done by buyer. I'm not sure there was any working at all by buyer in India. There was no manufacturing and it was hardly available to anyone in the public, and looking at the large mass of patients who required this drug, the compulsory license was granted in 2012, and uh, at 4%, as I said earlier, uh, net selling price as the royalty rate. And uh, this went to the IPAB, which was uh, which increased it from 6% to 7%. And uh, this was upheld by the Bombay High Court and by the Supreme Court. What was interesting in this case was the fact that Bayer did not even choose to lead any evidence in respect of its investment in developing this drug. So I personally feel that if they had led that evidence, uh, the royalty rate may have been higher, but uh, the controller did take into account as to what could be a reasonable price, which the uh, consumer or the patient can uh, afford in India for kidney and liver cancer. And accordingly, the uh, royalty rate was uh, fixed by the controller. And uh, in my own experience, this is the only case where compulsory license has been granted. And I must say that even during this pandemic, I was uh, presiding over the writ jurisdiction in April and May when the second wave hit India. And uh, there were several drugs where uh, the, you know, I used to find cases of drugs where patented drugs were not available at all and they were being sold at 20 times the rate and in black markets. And therefore, I do think that patentees ought to have been, uh, you know, more um, made access to these patented drugs more uh, easy, at least during the COVID pandemic. And uh, I'm sure they are taking steps now, but uh, we did face a big crisis during the second wave of the COVID pandemic, but no seal was issued. Yeah. So, thank you very much. Uh, as we have heard, uh, the Swarfani case was the uh, only case where uh, compulsory licensing was granted in India. What is noteworthy is that when examining uh, the granting of uh, the uh, compulsory licensing, uh, what was most important was that whether it was provided at a reasonable price to the public. Next, uh, we'll move on to Germany. Uh, with regards to the 2017 the federal Supreme Court decision of Rato Gravier. Uh, please, uh, Professor Oli, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. So Ralte Gravier is the only case in recent German legal history in which a compulsory license was not only granted, but also upheld by the federal Supreme Court. The appellant in this case manufactured a, a substance called Ralte Gravier, which fell within the scope of the, uh, of the, uh, the um, defendant's patent. Um, and this and Ralte Gravier was a substance which was used to treat HIV infections, and it turned out that it had less side effects on uh, pregnant women and on small children. Now, the applicant uh, applied for an unlimited compulsory license. The federal patents court rejected this unlimited compulsory license, but it was prepared to grant a compulsory license for the form for forms of administration which were already available in the market. And it did so in interim, or as you might call them, interlocutory proceedings. It's perhaps interesting to quote the second head note of the Federal Supreme Court judgment because it tells us something about the criteria for granting compulsory licenses. I quote, a public interest in the grant of a compulsory license for a pharmaceutical substance can exist even when only a relatively small group of patients is affected. This is the case in particular when this group would be exposed to an especially high risk if the medicament in question were no longer available. Available. In this case, the applicant was able to show that the uh, that the pro that the respondent's product and all other drugs that were available on the market had significant side effects when administered, as mentioned before, to pregnant women and to small children. Given that these groups of patients relied on the drug and that there was no reasonable alternative in the market, there was a sufficient public interest, although both groups were very small. Thank you. So thank you very much. In the case of Ralto Gravier uh, case at the Federal Supreme Court of Germany, it was the only case in which uh, the compulsory licensing has been recognized, especially in the decision of by the Supreme Court. Um, uh, rather than the small side of the patient, uh, uh, the small side effects of this product was emphasized. I think this was an important point. So because of the time constraint, uh, we'll move on to the second uh, question. First, we will uh, ask Professor Kumar to share cases about Zalaton of Pfizer and Fabrazyme of Genzyme and Abby's Ritonavir. Uh, thank you. There's been various cases where public interest groups have petitioned the National Institute of Health, the NIH, to exercise margin rights for drugs, but none of them have ever been successful. Back in 2004, petitioners sought a march, uh, sought margin rights for Pfizer's glaucoma treatment drug, Zalatan, and the basis for that challenge was that the U.S. price for Zalatan was higher than any other country in the world and they argued that was making it uh, too expensive for many patients. However, because the drug was readily available for purchase in the United States, the NIH denied the petition, saying that the drug was available. In 2009, um, another public interest group petitioned the NIH to utilize margin rights for Genzyme's Fabrazyme drug. And this was a very notable case because um, there was an actual drug shortage of Fabrazyme. There was not enough to supply patients who needed this in the United States. And there was evidence that patients were being harmed because of this. Um, and part of the, uh, the challenge was brought by patients who couldn't get access to the drug. Nevertheless, the NIH still denied the petition they noted that it would take too long to find a manufacturer willing to produce the drug and for that generic drug to gain regulatory approval, claiming that the drug shortage was not expected to last very long. Basically, the NIH was relying on assurances from the pharmaceutical company, um, even though the delay kept getting longer and longer than what was originally promised. Um, 
a third uh, a third petition attempt in 2004 and also 2012 public interest groups asked the NIH to utilize Marchand rights for six patents used to manufacture AbbVie's drug Ritonavir um, in order to reduce the cost of the drug. And again, the NIH de denied the request, um, concluding that AbbVie was producing an adequate supply of the drug and that they were providing it for free or at reduced cost for those who could not afford the, to pay the full price. Um, and the NIH once again declined to address pricing disparities between drug prices in the United States versus every other high income country in the world. So together these unsuccessful attempts show how reluctant the government is to utilize march and rights in the United States, even when there are drug shortages. Thank you. 네, Thank you. Next, the floor goes to uh, Judge Singh uh, to share cases on Dasatanib of uh, BMS and AstraZeneca Saxagliptin. Thank you. Okay. Um, in the case of uh, Dasatanib, this is a drug used for the treatment of chronic uh, myeloid leukemia, CML. And uh, in India, the cost of this drug was approximately about $1,360 and um, for a month therapy. Whereas uh, what the uh, BDR Pharmaceutical suggested as a generic company uh, when it applied for a compulsory license was that it would sell it at $100 or less than 10%, at about 8% of the uh, cost of the uh, patentee's drug. But uh, when BDR filed for an application um, for grant of compulsory license before the controller, the controller took the view that the requirements uh, and the conditions under Section 84 were not satisfied, and the compulsory license was rejected by the controller. The uh, company then, the BDR uh, company, went to the central government under Section 92 as well, but the central government held that there was no national emergency or um, urgency or any kind of crisis which required the grant of a compulsory license. So this was one of the cases where it was rejected. In the second case of Lee Pharma versus AstraZeneca, this is a drug called saxagliptin, which is a gliptin drug meant for diabetes uh, treatment. And uh, even in this, the case of Lee Pharma, the license application of Lee Pharma was rejected. The controller took a very interesting uh, view in this matter. What the controller did was it he, he used the comparable drugs which were available in the market, the various other gliptin drugs which were available, and felt that there was no major requirement because there were various other gliptins which were available, and also that those drugs were also available at an affordable price. The controller also held that saxagliptin's price was comparable to the other gliptin drugs. So on both issues, on the availability and on pricing, the controller took a view in favor of the uh, patentee, that is AstraZeneca, and uh, rejected the petition for compulsory license by Lee Pharma. I, uh, I'm aware of one more case where the license was rejected because in India, uh, post the, uh, the Doha declaration, under 92A, an Indian company can even export to a foreign company which does not have a manufacturing setup. And there was one application by Natco, I remember, for export of a patented drug to Nepal. However, the controller rejected it on the ground that uh, the proper sale and invoicing, et cetera, was not produced. And they were not sure about the genuinity of the person purchasing it in Nepal, though, of course, Nepal did not have sufficient manufacturing uh, capability. So a large number of CLs have been rejected by India, unlike the perception which is there internationally about this. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, next uh, to you, Professor Oli, uh, pass the floor uh, so that you can speak about the 1996 uh, Federal Supreme Court's uh, decision on polyperone as well as the Aliro Kumap. Thank you. There are two cases in German law in which applications for compulsory licenses were rejected. The first one is the decision uh, of 1995, that's the polyferone case, 
concerned um, and concerned um, an ingredient called interferon gamma, which was used to treat arthritis. And the applicant uh, argued or, or claimed um, a, a compulsory license and argued that polyferone was a very valuable drug because it had received an early marketing authorization and it was the only drug containing this particular ingredient, ingredient which was better for the treatment of arthritis. Well, the Federal Patent Court granted the compulsory license. It, so it thought that the invention of a new application of a patented substance was a strong indicator uh, for the public interest and that the disease uh, in, in question here, namely arthritis, was a very serious disease. The federal Supreme Court, however, allowed the appeal. This was really the first judgment in recent uh, German legal history which concerned compulsory licenses, licensing. So the federal Supreme Court reviewed older judgments of the time before the Second World War, also looked into the Paris Convention. And then uh, the Supreme Court agreed with the Patent Court that the public interest could justify the grant of a compulsory license if the pharmaceutical product had significant, uh, had therapeutical qualities which were significantly better than those of the drugs available in the market. However, uh, on the basis of the evidence given by a court-appointed expert, the federal Supreme Court was not convinced that polyferone actually had these properties, so uh, the case failed or the application failed on the facts. The second case is a recent case, Aliro Kumap, um, decision of 2020, um, and this second case um, is concerned uh, a, a monoclonal antibody which reduced cholesterol levels, and the applicant um, the applicant claimed that uh, this drug was significantly better than anything else on the market, and that it actually saved lives. Now, once again, the the second head note of the federal Supreme Court is quite instructive, and I quote: "The public interest requiring the grant of a public license for a medicinal product may be affirmed if significant results of a clinical." study according to recognized principles of biostatistics have shown that the active substance of the medicinal product has therapeutic products uh, which are not or not to the same extent proven for other products on the market. However, the application failed on the facts. The applicant had argued that its product significantly reduced the risk of people dying from metabolic disorders and the court felt that the, uh, that the applicant had not satisfied its owners of proof um, and hence the patent court and also on appeal the federal supreme court denied the compulsory license. 네. 네, 감사합니다. So thank you very much. After listening to the cases in different countries, so I think the ground uh, for admitting uh, the granting, the compulsory licenses is similar. However, the grounds uh, for dismissing is all different. So happy families are all happy for the same reasons, but unhappy uh, families are unhappy for different reasons. This was a quote from Anna Karina and reminded of this quote. And now I pass on the floor to the Korean speaker. So in the case of uh, Korea, there are or not many cases of compulsory licensing. And so I'm going to uh, uh, introduce uh, two representative cases where the application had been refused. So first is a Gleevec uh, case. Uh, Gleevec is a tr uh, treatment for leukemia, non-government organization so against Novartis, the patentee, uh, filed a petition for adjudication uh, and grant of non-exclusive license for Gleevec. The principal ground for the petition for education was that it was particularly necessary for the public interest to provide an affordable generic drug by granting a compulsory license because of insufficient supplies of Gleevec and its high price that hinders the patients suffering from CMR from consuming the drug. The uh, respondent argued that in determining whether to grant a compulsory license, the following factors must be taken into account. The urgency of granting the compulsory license, number of patients, contagiousness, the accessibility of drug, existence, existence of alternative means. However, the respondent argued that the alleged compulsory license should not be granted because the number of patients was only about 600, the disease was not infectious, the drug has been supplied sufficiently, and Gleevec is not on the list of H WHO list of essential medicines. The Commissioner of Kipo dismissed the petition for adjudication on the following grounds. All chronic uh, leukemia patients were subject to national health insurance at the time, meaning patients only have to pay about 10 percent of the drug price set by the Ministry of Health and Welfare, and Gleevec supply was sufficient at the time, and importing the drug for self 
health medication pursuant to the relevant article stipulated in the Foreign Trade Act was uh, allowed. Let me introduce a second case, the Fuseon case. Uh, Fuseon is a medication for terminally ill AIDS patients and a Korean nonprofit organizations uh, filed a petition against uh, Trimeris, the owner of the patent for Fuseon. The petitioner argued that even if Fuseon was urgently uh, needed to treat AIDS and irreplaceable patients, access to the drug was severely restricted as Fuseon was not supplied in Korea for at least four years due to a failure in negotiation on the price. And uh, the commissioner of Kipo dismissed the petition for adjudication. The commissioner saw that the damage to the patent system would be greater if the patent right was to be restricted on the ground of discontinuation of drug supply due to negotiation failure in the price. Not only that, the commissioner considered the following factors, petitioners and non-government organizations failed to present detailed execution plans such as direct manufacturing, outsourced manufacturing, the import of the drugs. Thus, it was unclear whether the patient's access to the drug could be protected with a grant of a non-exclusive license, and AIDS medications other than Fuseon have been continuously developed and commercialized in Korea, and the patient's access to medicine was improved as the patentee supplied Fuseon for free and the urgency of adjudication was eased. Thank you very much. Thank you. So those were uh, responses from all of the panels on the prepared questions. Uh, we filled up our one hour allotted for the session, but oh, do we have any questions from the floor? Uh, please raise your hand if you do. Yes, since we are short on time, I think, uh, yes, it would be a good idea to uh, end the session here. I'm so uh, regretful that we have to end so soon, but we heard about the compulsory licensing uh, systems uh, from all of the panelists' countries. Uh, we earned a lot of insights. We had the honor of listening insights uh, from honorable panelists. I hope we will have another opportunity to hear more deeply about the topic from our panelists. And uh, thank you for all the on-site uh, on participants also. So that would bring an end to this session. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, with uh, this, we would like to wrap up the second session. We would like to uh, thank uh, our moderator as well as also the Korean speaker who uh, for moderating this session.